Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so, towards the end of last year, I was doing a project over in Zurich, and I get to fly over a little bit. And on a Tuesday night, I flew over, and my plane was delayed by about three hours. So I didn't get into Zurich till quite late. I was quite exhausted in time. I didn't get to my hotel till even later. And after sat on the runway for three hours at Heathrow, I really wanted a glass of wine. <laughs> I saw it though, so I went into the hotel. As I went through the section, I saw this. It had wine. Great. So I went to put my bags in the room and I came back down. I said to the nice chap, like a glass of wine, please. And he went, oh. I said, what's wrong? He said, I don't think the machine will let me. I was like, oh. But he was a nice chap. And he rummaged around in a drawer, got a little plastic card out, and he went over to it. And he popped it in a slot at the top of the machine there. You could sort of see it sticking out. Now, the first thing was, he wasn't the tallest of people. So he said to me, can you see what it says above it, please? <laughs> because the card blocked his view of seeing what it said. And it said, Ausfall. Apparently that was good. So he said to me, OK, what would you like? And I looked and I said, well, there's an hour only. And if it's good enough for Hannibal Lecter, it's good enough for me. So I'm going to have one of those, please. And he said, great, OK. And I can just see, corresponding to each bottle, there's a little nozzle that's coming out. So he got a glass. He said, what size would you like? And it's on expenses, so I went for a large one. <laughs> and he put the glass just by the nozzle there, and he pressed the large button. And what happened? This platform rose up inside. The bottle went up, a little hiss happened, and a tantalizing couple of seconds before I got a glass full of gas that <laughs> smelt vaguely of wine. <laughs> so I don't think this is a wine fart machine. So, <laughs> We went along the bottles, and all of these things are going up and down like a sort of pipe organ. But I didn't get a glass of wine. And I take pictures like this wherever I go, and, and uh, some of you I've worked with know that I take pictures of all sorts of things when things do and don't work properly. This didn't work, I didn't get my glass of wine. And the reason I bring it up is because a lot of the time, things can be very well engineered. And they can be very well intentioned as well but they still can give a really bad customer experience. Now, you could say the wine machine didn't really solve a problem. No real problem that actually a bottle of wine on the shelf or a bottle of wine in the cabinet couldn't do. At one point, I did say to him, can we just sort of get the key? I just open it up, please. And he said, well, we could, but the manager's got the key and she goes home at seven. So, but with robo-advice, as the speakers this morning have already said, we are trying to solve the problem with it, and the problem is the advice can. And it's a really good time for doing it. Not just because the RDR has made the changes in the industry and what is done, but also because technology is at a point now where people are getting really familiar with it. And they're using it not just to passively absorb information, they're using it to control their lives. And this is their life at home, their work life, their health, and of course their wealth. And in the finance industry in particular, financial organizations are tripping over each other to launch dashboards, portals, apps, and obviously what we're here for today, robot advice. I think just because the technology's there, it's almost obvious that we should be using it. It's a knee-jerk reaction a lot of the time. And what I'm here to say, really, is that yes, the advice may be robot, but your customers won't be. And that's kind of my field speciality. I research how people really make decisions, and I build products that align with reality, not just economic theory. And I believe that by understanding how people react and behave in these different situations, we can design platforms to go with the grain of how people make decisions and both improve their customer outcome as well as respecting the customer's autonomy. So here's an example of how people make financial decisions. Researchers in America got a group of people in, they gave them a certain amount of money. 
And they said, we've got two portfolios created for you. And with your money, you can put them in one, you can put them in the other, or you can split them. So what do they do? This is 50-50. They didn't quite know where to put them, so it's quite a good strategy. In psychology terms, we call it the diversification heuristic. In normal terms, you put it not, don't put all your eggs in one basket. If I have some money in this and some money in that, if this one goes wrong, I'm still okay. And that's not a bad strategy. So the experimenters learned from this, and they got another group of people in. But this time, they changed it to include a balanced fund. With already it has 50% 50 uh, 50 stocks and 50% bonds. And they asked again to a different group of people where would you put your money? And what happened was they split their money 50 50 between the portfolios again. It's not logical what they did, but it's a behaviour which has stood people in good stead through evolution in various other situations. And what they're doing, they're just putting it onto this because they're in a situation they're unfamiliar with. And yes, they did it the other way around, and the same result happened. Now the group here, and the group before, have made the same decision. And when they were asked, what did you do? They said, I split, I split it 50-50. But I don't need to tell you how different the outcome was for each one of those groups. And it's not because people are stupid. I sometimes get that, that people say, well, we can't help the stupid ones, can we? It's not that. And Harry Markowitz, founder of modern <coughs> portfolio theory and Nobel Prize winner in economics, was asked what he did with his personal money. <laughs> and if someone that clever in the industry cannot follow his own advice, then what's the hope for the rest of us? And it's not just an experiment that people make investing mistakes. We all know that this type of figure is ludicrous, that people are walking away from free money. And this is happening for real. And so we need to start looking at how people act and make decisions, and then build our robo-advice, our execution-only platforms to be able to deal with it. And even the smallest things can affect people's decisions. Now, I've got quite a frivolous example, but one I think is quite insightful in how we make decisions. Experiment has got a group of women in to, uh, to use an experiment of uh, take, no, to take part in some risky gambling experiments where they risk quite a large sum of money in order to win some more money. But what they did, just before the main experiment, there was a smaller, subtler experiment. And in this experiment, they were handling items of men's clothes. And what the researchers found was that the group of women that touched men's boxer shorts in the first experiment took riskier gambles with the money in the second experiment. Now what the researchers concluded was what was happening was the men's boxer shorts had sexual connotations about them. That triggers the, uh, uh, the reward centers in the brain and the circuitry in the brain basically releasing certain chemicals into the brain. And when you suddenly go into a new situation, those chemicals are still present and it will affect the decision. Now I know this because I do a little bit of talking and I get quite nervous. And then afterwards I suddenly get a release and all the endorphins and the serotonin comes into my brain because it's all over and I feel really happy. And I also find myself quite a lot of time in the Apple store buying a new gadget. <laughs> and I have to stop myself. I have to stop myself from going anywhere after talks like these because I will buy something and then afterwards I go, what did I do that for? Because I didn't do it. Something in me did it for me. <laughs> now depending on what books you read or what TED talks you've watched, you could call these behaviours, such as the diversification heuristic and the reason we don't like taking pensions, you could call them something like irrational, like Dan Ariely, fast and slow thinking, or metaphorically depict it as the elephant and the rider. And if you've read any of these, and they're very good, do read them, then you understand what I'm meaning. Well, that's all very good for pop psychology bestsellers, but for me, I like to delve into that three pounds of grey mush that sits between our ears. 
our brains, and I brought a uh, little Yorick here, our brain is the most fascinating organ in our body. I think if we can understand how the circuitry works, it means that we switch out both what we say to the customers and how we give advice. And I haven't got long enough to go fully into it, but I'm going to go and touch on it. And the first thing I want to say is everyone in this room, everyone in this world, has three brains. And I'm not talking metaphorically, I'm not talking like left brain, right brain, uh, I'm not talking about uh, uh, anything like that, that's rubbish by the way, that is a myth. You can really catch, catch me afterwards. And the 10% of our brain's myth is equally a myth. I'm talking about physical structures in the brain. Now what we have is our hind brain. Comes up from the brain stem, joins at the back. That deals with anything which is automatic. So anything like your pupil dilation, your uh, blood pressure, your heart rate. You're not thinking about how you're sitting in your seat now. You're not thinking about all the muscles that are involved in keeping you upright, sliding onto the floor like jelly. But you are doing it. Some part of you is doing it, and you have no conscious access to that part of the body. That's that bit. Our midbrain, our limbic system in the middle, hypothalamus, thalamus, deals with our emotions. It's our fear, our aggression, and our love. We have no conscious access to that either. Where we probably think about the brain more often is the pink curly bit you see on the outside. Actually, if you ever see a brain, it's more gray. You probably won't want to see it. <laughs> that's where we reside. That's our consciousness. That's where your memory, your language, your rational thinking, your logic is sat. That's where if you have a little voice in your head, that's where it is. Now, interestingly, we think that part of the brain makes the decisions, because it's us, isn't it? But when they do fMRI scans, PET scans on brains, and uh, look at the electromagnetic activity in the brain, when somebody's making a decision, it's the midbrain that makes the decision first. And then the, the cortex afterwards becomes active. So what you're doing is rationalizing a decision that you already feel. Sometimes I don't rationalize very well when I'm stood in the Apple store and I've suddenly got an Apple Watch without realizing it. Uh, my midbrain's got its way without the temporal lobes really kicking in and my executive function going there. And I think when we create robo-advice, we sit in boardrooms and we activate our rational brains. And we try and think from our rational side what customers will react to. But actually, when it comes to receiving robo-advice, we use our mid-brains. Customers use their mid-brains to make a decision. It's quite an emotional decision. And the conscious brain is the smallest bit of what's happening. And it's been demonstrated very reliably in laboratories as well as ethnographic studies, that when faced with decisions that are unfamiliar, and finance is unfamiliar to a lot of people, and most people, then we do not use our conscious brain to make a decision. And research I conducted a few years ago on credit cards. And what we found was the biggest decision factor <coughs> on which credit card people chose was the design of the credit card. <laughs> so when you realize what part of the brain you should be communicating to, you also realize why financial education projects fail. It's the time when you think, well, if they don't know about inflation, annuities, or crystallization, oh, well, we need to educate our clients, don't we? Well, it doesn't always do a lot. When I take my car to the garage, I don't want to be educated about the carburetor. I want a car that goes. So we just want to start to think about what customers need and how to build that into a platform. You also realize that as the decision to save or invest is actually a choice to deny that instant gratification, to deny that midbrain what it was, and in exchange for some future financial gain, then actually you realize that the true competition, I think, to those other advice is Disneyland, it's Apple, it's Amazon, and it's Black Friday. You also sort of realize why, I don't quite know why, the midbrain loves flat screen telly so much. <laughs> it does. 
And I don't think you'll see the scenes that you see outside of Apple on launch days, outside of Hargreaves Lansdowne when they launched their Wealth 150. <laughs> and I don't think, really, Neil Woodford <laughs> is ever going to get groupies in the same way as Justin Bieber. So when creating robo-advice platforms, I think the first thing to do is acknowledge what you're up against. And that is the human brain. And when designing both the interface, but also the proposition itself, the actual shape of what you're giving the customers, think about the reality of how people make decisions. Secondly, I think realize that robo-advice is not a technology solution. It might use technology as the medium, but it's not a technology solution, it's a human thing. So whatever you do, do not let engineers design your robo-advice systems. Remember what happened to George Lucas when he thought that technology had advanced so much it could improve Star Wars. <laughs> Larry and I did not have a full hand on that. So for me, that's why every financial organization, especially those involved in FinTech, should get a psychologist in the boardroom so that anything can go past them to make sure that you're not doing anything wrong towards the customers. And academic psychologists are working on this. People like Dan Ariely, Ugo Panizza, Richard Taylor, David Eagleman, and even Paul Dolan, just down the road at the uh, London School of Economics, are all advancing ways of how we can build psychology into digital platforms. So talk to them. They like talking to businesses. And if you don't, then you could end up with a RA solution that's well engineered, that's well intentioned, but does lead to a bad customer outcome. A bit like me not getting my glass of wine. And if this happens, at best, your customers just won't engage with it. But at worst, you could end up giving your customers a worse customer outcome. And you know, whatever we do, we don't want to give the financial industry a bad name, do we? <laughs> so if we do all of this, and we focus it towards the customers, have we solved the advice gap? Probably not. I mean, robo-advice is an answer, but it's not the solution, and the speakers before me have sort of alluded towards this. That may go to financial advisors. And when people start earning in their life, when do they start actually saving for their finances? And I think that's the sort of thing that I'm working with a few clients on at the moment, and I get my great match on too, and I know it's the sort of thing that Harry and Sam are going to talk about a little bit more. But for me, that's it for now. Thank you very much for listening.